So in the previous uh, part of the lecture, we talked about skin friction drag caused by shear stress. But the other kind of drag that can be very significant depending on the situation is pressure drag, which is primarily caused by flow separation. But it's important for some flow conditions. So specifically, it's negligible for fully attached flow, and we'll see what that means in a moment. And it's important if the flow is separated. We'll also see exactly what that means. So imagine we have some incoming velocity v infinity and we have an airfoil at an angle of attack. So the streamlines look something like this. Then in this region, the flow is separated because there's a region where the flow is circulating around. And as far as the inviscid outside of viscous region flow is concerned, it's like this airflow has grown a big wart on the back of it. And in terms of the effect on the flow field, there will be a high pressure here and a low pressure in this separated region. And the combination of these gives a net force in the flow direction. And a force in the flow direction is a pressure drag. Okay, so then the thing we need to know is when will the flow separate? So let's consider the flow over a cambered airfoil. So if it's at zero angle of attack, maybe it looks something like that. And we have V infinity out here. And the streamlines will look something like this. Further away, be deflected less. Underneath, more or less follows. Something like this. So this is at zero angle of attack. And this is what we call attached flow. Everywhere the streamlines closely follow the contour of the surface. Now it's considered the same airfoil at a high angle of attack. And we have V infinity here. Uh, but now if I draw streamlines, the streamline would deflect it up and over, but it won't come all the way back down. And we'll have a region of separated flow. And this is for alpha large. So usually separation 
might happen in the range of 15 to 20 degrees, but that's highly dependent on the airfoil. So for these two cases, if we look at the upper surface pressure distribution, we can start to get some clues as to why and when and where the flow will separate. So. This axis is CP. This axis is X over the cord, so that one is at the cord. Then I'll draw in black an approximate sketch of the upper surface pressure distribution for the zero angle of attack case. Starts off with a stagnation point. And gradually increases after a relatively sharp decrease near the front. Now in red I'll draw the pressure distribution for the airfoil at a high angle of attack and it's all going to start off roughly at the same point but it's going to pressure is going to drop much more aggressively and then it's going to recover quickly and then end up higher and essentially stay at this value. So just as a reminder here, red is for alpha large, black is for alpha zero or, or small. So the key to separation is the presence of a strong adverse pressure gradient. specifically in the boundary layer. So if the streamwise direction is S, we mean DPDS is much larger than zero. So for the alpha equals zero case, DPDS is positive, generally, at least on the back half of the airfoil, but it's small. The slope of this line is not too great. So the flow is decelerating, but it can manage. Whereas for the alpha large case, the PDS in this region is very large, and so the flow just cannot cope in the boundary layer. And so it separates instead. So now we've identified when separation will occur. It will occur when there's too strong of an adverse pressure gradient. So the next question is, what are the consequences of separation? So there are two major consequences. The first is reduced lift. And another term for this is saying that the airfoil has stalled. 
And this is due to a higher pressure over much of the upper surface. So the fact that this red line is above the black line for a large length percentage of the length of the airfoil. And it's also due to the inclination of the resultant force vector on the airfoil. In a moment I'll draw a picture to illustrate this more clearly. Second consequence is increased drag. And this is due to low pressure near the trailing edge. on the upper surface. And again, also because of the inclination of the resultant force. So if I sketch these two situations out, small angle of attack and large angle of attack, you can see what I mean. So there's the airfoil. Here we have maybe some lift, some drag, and therefore this resultant force. Now, if we take that airfoil and we increase the angle of attack, R may not change all that much. relative to the airfoil, but the lift, which is defined as being perpendicular to the incoming velocity, and the drag, which is parallel to it, change significantly. So again, we have low pressure out here, and high pressure out here, but this is now acting much closer to the horizontal direction. So this gives a net drag increase. So you can see here the two mechanisms at play. Lift is reduced because of a change in the pressure distribution and also because of a decrease in the amount of the resultant force vector that's pointed in the direction perpendicular to the incoming velocity. And the drag increases due to the low pressure at the trailing edge, which provides some amount of force in the horizontal direction, and also, again, the inclination of this resultant force, meaning that more of the total force acts in the direction of the incoming velocity. So, then the last question that we need to answer about separation for this preliminary look at it is why does the flow separate? So to properly answer that question, at least half a course would be needed just to, to address this. But at a high level, there's a pretty simple answer. And I think the easiest example is to consider the flow in a diffuser. So you have an X, Y coordinate system like that. And then here's our diffuser. So there are the walls. And the flow goes through the diffuser. The area increases and the flow slows down. So pressure is lowest at the inlet and highest at the outlet. So if we look at the pressure gradients here, dpdx is positive 
and dp dy, the pressure gradient across the channel, is basically zero. So the flow that's in the adverse pressure gradient is decelerating. And we have the same pressure gradient both in and out of the boundary layer. So outside the boundary layer, the fact that the flow is slowing down due to the adverse pressure gradient is no problem. But if we have a close look inside the boundary layer, and there's a very good illustration of this, figure 15.3 in your text, page 897. Um, but I'll sketch something similar here. Here's the wall. This is, say, the bottom wall of the diffuser. And here's the boundary layer edge. Remember, you have low pressure here and high pressure here. Well, at the beginning, there's some velocity in the main flow, and of course, because it's a boundary layer and the no-slip condition is in effect, the velocity must decrease to zero at the wall. Now, as we go a little further downstream, the velocity in the main stream has slowed down owing to the pressure gradient. But the slower the velocity is inside the boundary layer, the more it's slowed down. So eventually we get to a point where the velocity profile looks like this. It has a sharp point. And then if the diffuser isn't over, isn't finished yet, and the flow needs to decelerate even more, the main velocity decreases even further. And then eventually, the flow reverses inside the boundary layer. There's a region near the wall where the flow starts going in the opposite direction. And this can be explained really easily um, by if we do a little bit of a change of coordinate system and say that our x direction is along the direction of this wall, Basically, u du dx from the Navier-Stokes equation is negative 1 over rho dp dx. If nothing's changing in the other directions. And so what you can see is, since this is the same for all y values, which is in the direction normal to the wall, we have the same pressure gradient acting on different velocities. And so where the velocity is high, the velocity gradient, the amount of deceleration, is small. And if the amount, if the velocity is small, then the deceleration is large. So we can say, that the same pressure gradient causes larger decelerations in the slower flow. So basically, this pressure gradient starts causing a flow reversal in the boundary layer long before the flow in the mainstream has slowed down to zero speed. So this is an unstable situation, and this is what results in flow separation. I'll draw one more picture to illustrate what happens once this flow reversal has occurred. So here's our expanding wall again. 
And there's our boundary layer. And if I redraw the reverse flow velocity profile from before, once this occurs, the thickness of the boundary layer effectively blows up and there's a recirculating flow, right? You can see that flow on this side is going forward and on this side is going backward. So there's a net circulation of flow from the upper side of the boundary layer towards the lower side of the boundary layer and back again. And this ends up being completely separate from the outside flow uh, in a similar manner that when we considered the potential flow model of the flow over a cylinder, there were streamlines and a flow pattern inside the cylinder in the potential flow model, but it didn't affect the flow outside other than to cause a movement of the stream so streamlines to create that cylinder here the circulation pushes the streamline out and you get this large recirculation region. So the separated flow results from this local flow reversal in the boundary layer. And we won't be able to get any more quantitative than this. We'll just have to be satisfied with this qualitative discussion for now. Um, when you study, if you continue to study fluid mechanics, Eventually, you'll learn that there are good tools that can be used to quantify exactly when this will occur. Um, but again, that's a little bit beyond what I wanted to get across to you guys today. Uh, I wanted to give you a quick flavor for the aspects of viscous flow that are important to airfoil aerodynamics because when this happens on an airfoil is when on your CL versus alpha plot, this occurs. The airfoil stalls and you get a dramatic decrease in lift. And if you're looking at the drag, that's where suddenly the drag shoots up dramatically. So this is an important phenomenon to understand um, in that it limits the performance of airfoils.